We shall now turn to Psalm 24, and we could read again at verse 3. Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Surely there's no more suitable verse in the whole Bible for the Thursday night of a communion. Who's fit to ascend the Mount of Ordinance? Which one of us can climb this hill to the Lord's table? Who can approach God? Who dare? Who can sit at the Lord's table? Surely we need to prepare ourselves. It's a holy ordinance. (coughs) Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Surely we need to humble ourselves and confess our sins and repent and turn again unto the Lord. Now this psalm, you notice, is a psalm of David. David is the author of it. Generally it's regarded as having been written at the time when the ark of the Lord was brought up to Jerusalem. And earlier in the service, we read 2 Samuel chapter 6, when that took place. And you note it as we read the psalm there, as we read the passage there in Samuel, you noted that the first time they tried to take the ark up from the house of Abinadab, to the city of David, it ended in disaster. Uzzah, the son of Abinadab, put out his hand and touched the ark and fell down dead. He thought he was doing something to help. The oxen were shaking the ark. The ark could land in the mud. But how dare you, Uzzah, put your filthy hand upon the ark of the Lord? How dare you think that your hand is cleaner than the mud on the ground? It would be better for the ark to land in the mud than for a sinner to dare to touch the Ark of God. And so David is shocked and Israel are shocked and they take the Ark and David's frightened to take it up to his own house and so he puts it into the house of Obedidon the Gittite and it remains there for three months. But then David hears, hears the news. God's blessing the house of Obededim. God is particularly revealing his mercy and his love and his kindness to them. And so David looks again at this and decides that, yes, he will seek to bring up the ark of the Lord to Jerusalem. And so They take the ark, and this time they remember the regulative principle of worship. They remember that there's rules and duties, and it's not just a matter of doing what we like, 
doing what we think is good. It's not just a matter of having a nice new cart and putting the ark on that. God had said the ark should only be carried by the priests and the Levites. And so the priests and the Levites are gathered and sacrifices are offered and things are done as God required, as God had laid down at Mount Sinai and in the scriptures. And now they are able to bring the ark to Jerusalem. And as they come to Jerusalem, you notice the end of the, the psalm here. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. You see, the ark was the symbol of God's presence. That's what it, it referred to. The mercy seat on top of the ark where God sat between the cherubims. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. But then the ark also was a symbol, a type of Christ. Because Christ is God's presence with us, isn't he? It's a picture of Christ. And interestingly, the Jews had a tradition. A tradition of singing this psalm on the day after the Sabbath. And what's the day after the Sabbath? The first day of the week. The day on which Christ rose from the dead. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors. The King of glory is risen from the dead. The King of glory is ascending into heaven. How wonderful. Lift up your heads, O oh doors, everlasting doors of heaven, to receive the King of glory himself. Who is this King of glory? Who is this Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So we have here a type of Christ. Christ ascending up to heaven, entering in to the glory. Well, let's look at the verses then before us. The psalm begins with a presentation of the glory of God. God, what is he like? The Lord. Jehovah. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell in it. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who is God? He's the creator. He's the one who has made all things. He's the one who raised the earth out of the sea, who created the continents. He is the one who at a later date, you remember, caused the earth to emerge from the flood waters that had destroyed the ancient world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He made it. He hath founded it upon the seas and established it. Everything that's in the earth belongs to him. He created it for his own glory. He's the sovereign Lord. He's the potter. And you and I are the clay. We've got to remember that. He makes one vessel to honour. Another to dishonour. And he's got every right to do that. We have no rights. God has all rights. Stop talking about human rights. Start talking about God's rights. God demands honour. He alone has rights. He's the sovereign one. He placed our first parents in the Garden of Eden. He blessed them with all blessings, promises. Gave them so many good things. Thousands of trees bearing fruit which they could eat. He blessed them with his own presence, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And he gave them a warning. One tree, just one tree in the garden, you're not allowed to eat of it. 
and in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And our first parents, you remember, did the very thing they were told not to do, broke the covenant, and so they were expelled from the garden. Our God's not somebody to play around with. Our God's not somebody that you can treat with contempt. Hath God said, so said Satan, hath God really said, you shall not surely die. God has spoken and you shall die. God's word is truth. What God says is law and it happens. Our God is a consuming fire. Who can dwell with everlasting burnings? Can you dwell with a consuming fire? We are to worship him with reverence and godly fear. The angels themselves cover their faces in his presence. They fall down before him in worship. This is something we need today. There's so little of the fear of God in our churches. God is regarded as a chum, a Father Christmas kind of figure. Go to him and ask what you want. And you can treat his word with very little reverence, almost contempt, his law, his judgments. But our God is great. The earth is the Lord's. He's the one that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. The great and mighty God. If only we had more of a sense of the glory and the majesty and the greatness of God. If only we feared him more, reverenced him more, respected him more. Gave to him the honour that is due to him. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know and my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. You have forsaken the Lord, you have turned away backward. God's calling us to give him respect. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein, they're in his hand. He will judge. He hath founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the floods. What a shock it was to David to meet God. To meet God as he brought up the ark. To see the real God. The God who in a flash destroyed Uzzah. Uzzah who was so earnest, so genuine, trying to help. His brother Ahio was before the cart and he was behind and he was looking after everything. And he, he was so sincere and he meant it, wasn't he? The ark was about to fall off the car and he goes to hold it up. He means well, but it's not enough to mean well. It's not enough to be sincere. God's holy. Treat him with respect. Our God is a consuming fire. Let us worship him with reverence and godly fear as he himself prescribes. So that leads us then secondly to ask the question who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? Who can approach this holy God? 
who can draw near to him, who can stand in his presence, who can come to the Lord's table and sit there in the presence of God and eat the bread and drink the wine. Where we're told certain things are required. If we're going to draw near to God, we need clean hands, a pure heart, not lifting up our soul unto vanity, nor swearing deceitfully. Clean hands. Do you have clean hands? There's been a lot of emphasis recently with this COVID on keeping your hands clean. But there's something far more serious here. Clean hands. What does it mean? Spiritually clean hands. What are your hands? Your hands are the things that are involved in actions. Your actions. Are your actions clean? Are they right? Are they good? Are they acceptable with God? Have you ever done anything wrong? Sin clings to your hands. Have you acted in anger? Acted in lust? Acted in Sabbath breaking? Acted in stealing? Your hands, are they clean? Is there any guilt in your hands? Any at all? Any black marks there? Have you ever defiled your hands? Ever? And a pure heart. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But those who are not pure in heart won't see God. Those who are not pure in heart end up in hell. Blessed are the pure in heart. Is your heart pure? Your thoughts, your daydreams. What about these wandering thoughts in church? What about blasphemous thoughts? Lustful thoughts? Resentful thoughts? Jealous thoughts? Covetous thoughts? Do you have a clean heart, pure heart? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the hearts. I know it. I know your heart. You can't hide your heart from me. Who shall approach the hill of God? Who shall come into his presence? Who shall come and sit at the table? The one with clean hands and a pure heart. Surely none of us have pure hearts. Who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity. Vanity is an idol, a vain thing. Something that has ears but cannot hear, eyes but cannot see, a mouth but cannot speak, feet but cannot walk. Lifted up his soul to an idol. How often Israel lifted up their soul to idols. Now you and I 
Don't bow down before silver or gold shrines. But do we have idols? What is an idol? Anything that comes between us and God. Anything that we love more than God. Every, anything that takes us from loving God. Takes away our thoughts from him. Anything that fills our minds or distracts us in our worship. Anything we set our affection upon. Our work. Our home. Our family. A person. A thing. A pleasure. A hobby. All these things become vanities. Vain, stupid things that we set our heart upon in contrast to setting them upon the creator, the ruler, the judge. <clears throat> Have you ever lifted up your soul to vanity, to an idol? Or sworn deceitfully we sin in thought, word, and deed. Thought, the heart. Deed, the hands. Words, swearing deceitfully. Lies. Backbiting, gossiping, slandering. Unkind words. Hypocrisy, pretense. Showing off. Are we not all guilty? Guilty of swearing deceitfully. Guilty of deceiving and lying. And distorting the truth. And so we see that this psalm is very challenging. Who can approach God? Who can come to the Lord's table? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? The one whose hands are clean, whose heart is pure, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Surely all of us stand condemned tonight. And the fact that all of us are condemned is no excuse. It's not a matter of saying, well, everybody else like that. How many people there are in the world today are saying, well, there's so many other people like me, I'm not worse than anybody else. Do you think that'll save them from hell? Broad is the road, broad is the <coughs> gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in their at. Well, thirdly, we have here God's provision. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The God of salvation. That's what we need, isn't it? To receive a blessing. The blessing of salvation. And what is the blessing of salvation? It's, it's righteousness. A right standing with God. That's our great need. We need a saviour. His name shall be called Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. The Son of God came to a lost, perishing world. And the Son of God took our sins upon himself and died on the cross. He took our filthy hands, took our impure heart, took our mouths with a swearing deceitfully, took our place 
as those who had been guilty of idolatry, took our sins, took our punishment. He was made sin for us. Made sin. The Holy One made sin for us. So many sins put upon him that he was made sin. He was made a curse for us, cursed, so that he would redeem us from the curse of the law. And there he was coming to John for baptism. And John says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What a shiver must have gone through Christ when he heard these words. The lamb, the sacrificial lamb, to bear the sin, the sin of all his people, all their sins and their punishment. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is justification? An act of God's grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. None of us have a pure heart. But Christ had a pure heart. Christ is the one who has clean hands, a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, the Son of God alone, of all mankind, the only one who has clean hands, a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he is the one who can approach the hill of God. But also, he is the one who gives to us his righteousness. And he takes our sin and God's wrath and the consuming fire burns him up. And he is destroyed in our place. And yet not totally destroyed. For on the third day he rises again, having satisfied divine justice and reconciled us to God. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. How? For Jesus' sake, and only for Jesus' sake. Who are they arrayed in white, in white garments? These are they that have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are they that have passed through great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white and the blood of the Lamb. So we see here God's provision. He shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. We need righteousness, and righteousness is a gift from God. It's imputed to us and received by faith alone. And the blessing of the Lord is the blessing of salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. It's God's work from beginning to end. 
He has begun the good work and he will perform it till the day of Christ Jesus. Salvation is God's work. God's provision. But then, finally, our duty. And we have a duty. Verse 6. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. We have a duty to seek the Lord and to go on seeking the Lord. To seek him today, to seek him tomorrow, to seek him the day after. Why is there a reference here to, to Jacob? It would seem in the authorised version that, the, um, that Jacob is, is here used almost as for God. But actually in the Hebrew it's, that's not the case. It's Jacob here is referred to. Because Jacob was the deceiver. Jacob is here referring to the people, the deceivers, the sinners. Those who seek God's face. Jacob seeks God's face. And you remember how Jacob did. I will not let thee go unless thou bless me. Until thou bless me. Clinging, as it were, to God. Jacob, the deceiver, the liar, who had sworn deceitfully. But now he has clean hands and a pure heart because he has given the righteousness of Christ. And Jacob here is a picture of you and me, sinners. Sinners by nature, sinners by practice, filthy hands, an impure heart. But yet, washed and cleansed, justified, accepted. Think of David in another psalm, Psalm 51, crying out to God. Create in me a clean heart. He's not talking there about his first conversion. He's an old Christian. And he's still saying, create in me a clean heart. I need a new creation. I need a new conversion. I've sinned. I've sinned terribly. But create in me a clean heart, Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. I need a new beginning. Yes, indeed. That is the, the cry of God's people. And that's the kind of cry we should have on a Thursday night of the communion as we confess our sin and face up to that impure heart, to these filthy hands, to these idols in our lives to that mouth of ours which is so sinful in what it says, swearing deceitfully. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart. Seeking, turning. Think of the words in James. James chapter 4. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. That's addressed to you and to me. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Double-minded. A heart on idols as well as on God. But you can't have that. You can't serve God and mammon. It's no use. God doesn't, doesn't allow any rivals in your heart. He calls on you to love him with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. 
Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Do you? Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But our duty is there, isn't it? If we confess our sins, what happens if we don't? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us. But if we don't confess our sins, have you any right to expect your sins to be forgiven? If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's what we've got to do. Through the Spirit, with the aid of God's Spirit, to mortify, to put to death, to battle against the sin within us, the sin in our hearts, because it's from the heart that all other sins proceed. And you and I have to wage war against the sin within. And by God's grace, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, get victory over sin. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Romans 8.13 Put away your idols. Cast away your false gods. Wash your hands in the blood of Christ. Purify your hearts, sprinkling the blood of Christ upon them. Humble yourself before the Lord. Realize his greatness, his glory, his holiness, his hatred for sin. Turn from your sin, trusting in Jesus washed in the blood. Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray.